In our last lesson, we defined obligations and contracts as that body of rules which deals with the nature and sources of obligations and the rights and duties arising from agreements and the particular contracts. In this lesson, we will focus our study on the sources of obligations. But first, what is an obligation? Article 1156 of the Civil Code defines an obligation as a juridical necessity to give, to do, or not to do. The words juridical necessity connote that in case of non-compliance, there will be legal sanctions. There are four elements of an obligation. First is the active subject or the one who is demanding the performance of the obligation. It is he who is in his favor. The obligation is constituted, established, or created. He is called the creditor or obligee. Second is the passive subject, the one bound to perform the prestation to give, to do, or not to do. He is called the debtor or obliger. Third is the prestation or object, the subject matter of the obligation which has an economic value or susceptible of pecuniary substitution in case of non-compliance. And fourth is the efficient cause or the juridical tie or vinculum by virtue of which the debtor has become bound to perform the prestation. To illustrate the elements of an obligation, let us look at this contract. Under a service contract, Cesar bound himself to repair Bernard's sports car for 1 million pesos. In this agreement, Bernard is the active subject. He is the one who is demanding the performance of the obligation. He is the one who in his favor the obligation is constituted. Cesar is the passive subject. He is the one bound to perform the prestation that is repairing the car. The repair of the car is the prestation. The prestation or object is the subject matter of the obligation which has an economic value or susceptible of pecuniary substitution in case of non-compliance. The agreement or contract is the efficient cause. The efficient cause is the tie or vinculum by virtue of which the debtor has become bound to perform the prestation. Suppose Cesar already repaired the car and it was agreed that Bernard would pay Cesar after the repair is finished. Is there a change in the passive and active subject? The answer is yes. In this case, Cesar now becomes the active subject. He now becomes the one who demands the performance of the obligation that is the payment of the agreed consideration in the amount of 1 million pesos. Bernard now becomes the passive subject, the one who is bound to perform the prestation that is to give the payment of 1 million pesos. In our study of obligation, there is a need for us to correlate right an obligation. When there is a right, there is a corresponding obligation. Right is the active aspect while obligation is the passive aspect. It is like the two sides of a coin. Thus, it is said the concepts of credit and debt are two distinct aspects of unitary concept of obligation. And before we move on to our Main topic for this lesson, you have to understand this concept, the concept of prestation. Prestation is not the thing, but the particular conduct of the debtor. It may consist in giving, doing, or not doing something. Obligation to give consists in the delivery of a movable or immovable thing to the creditor. Obligation to do covers all kinds of works or services, whether physical or mental. 
and obligation not to do consist in refraining from doing some acts. An obligation not to deliver is included in obligation not to do. Thus, a debtor shall not deliver a thing if the court has issued a restraining order or injunction to that effect. And one last note before we proceed to the sources of obligations. Note that the definition of obligation in Article 1156 refers to civil obligations which are enforceable in court when breached. It does not cover natural obligations because these obligations cannot be enforced in court being based merely on equity and natural law and not on positive law. Okay, so what are the sources of obligations? Article 1157 of the Civil Code provides that obligations arise from number one, law, number two, contracts, number three, quasi-contracts, number four, acts or omissions punished by law, and number five, quasi-delicts. Obligations arising from law. There are obligations which arise from law, such as the obligations of parents to support their minor children as provided for in Article 195 of the Family Code, the duty of spouses to render mutual support and respect to one another under Article 68 of the Family Code, and the duty of taxpayers to pay their taxes to the government as provided for in the Internal Revenue Code. Obligations derived from law are never presumed. Unless such obligations are expressly provided by law, they are not demandable and enforceable. As such, they cannot be presumed to exist. Obligations arising from contracts. Article 1159 of the Civil Code provides that obligations arising from contracts have the force of law between the contracting parties and should be complied with in good faith. Obligations arising from contracts entered into by contracting parties are primarily governed by the stipulations, clauses, terms, and conditions of their agreements. These stipulations, clauses, terms, and conditions, if they do not violate any law, morals, good customs, public order, or public policy, shall have the force of law and should be complied with in good faith. Obligations arising from quasi-contracts. So, what is a quasi-contract? A quasi-contract is a juridical relation which arises from a lawful, voluntary, and unilateral act or acts executed by somebody for the benefit of another for which the former must be indemnified to the end that no one shall be enriched or benefited at the expense of another. It is a kind of contract created without the consent of one party, but whose missing consent is given by law. There are two principal kinds of quasi-contract. One is negotiorum gesture. This is a juridical relation which takes place when somebody takes charge of the agency or management of the business or property of another without any power from the latter. The owner of the business or property shall reimburse the gestor for the necessary and useful expenses incurred by the latter and for the damages suffered by him in performance of his functions as gestor. Let us illustrate negotiorum gesture. While you are traveling abroad, a typhoon hits your hometown, causing heavy flood, and your car that is parked in your garage is in danger of being submerged in flood water. To avoid the catastrophic situation, your neighbor does something to prevent the flood water from reaching your garage. In this case, you are the principal and your neighbor is the gestor. The act of which save your car is 
is the negotiorum gesture. The question here is that, are you obliged to reimburse your neighbor of the expenses that he incurred in preserving your car? Based on this principle, a negotiorum, based on the principle of negotiorum gesture, the answer is yes. The second kind of a quasi-contract is solutio indebiti. This is a juridical relation which takes place when somebody received something from another without any right to demand for it and the thing was unduly delivered to him through mistake. The obligation to return the thing arises on the part of the recipient. To illustrate, imagine that one day you are checking your balance in the ATM machine and was surprised to see that you have more than 5 million in your account because the last time you checked, you only have 5,000 in your account. Excited of your newfound wealth, you withdrew 500,000. A few hours later, you received a call from a bank employee informing you that there was a mistake in crediting 5 million pesos in your account. Are you obligated to return the 500,000 that you withdrew? Under the principle of solutio indebiti, the answer is yes. Let's move on to obligations arising from acts or omissions punished by law. Under Article 1161, civil obligations arising from criminal offenses shall be governed by the penal laws. This article refers to civil obligations arising from criminal offenses anchored on the well-accepted principle that every person criminally liable for a felony is also civilly liable. Arising from quasi-delic. Quasi-delic, also known as culpa aquiliana, is explained in Article 2176 of the Civil Code. Article 2176 provides that whoever, by act or omission, causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence, is obliged to pay for the damage done. Such fault or negligence, if there is no pre-existing contractual relation between the parties, is called a quasi-delic. Elements of quasi-delic Number one, there is fault or negligence on the part of the defendant resulting in a wrongful act or omission, whether voluntary or not, and whether criminal or not. Two, there is damage and injury suffered by another person. Three, there is a direct causal relation between the fault or negligence and the resulting damage and injury. This means that the fault or negligence is the proximate cause of the damage or injury. What is the meaning of fault or negligence? The Civil Code explained the meaning of fault or negligence in Article 1173. The article provides that the fault or negligence of the obliger consists in the omission of that diligence which is required by the nature of the obligation and corresponds with the circumstances of the person, of the time, and of the place. Succinctly stated, negligence is merely the want of care as required by the attending circumstances. It is relative and not absolute term. It changes with the changing circumstances of the persons involved the time and place of occurrence of the fault. It is a question of fact. What is the doctrine of proximate cause? In determining the liability of the tort fessor in quasi-delic, the law only looks for the proximate cause and not the remote cause. It is the proximate cause which has produced the damage or injury complained of. Hence, other causes in the chain of events which existed before the proximate cause would not be inquired into
because in the natural sequence of events, they have not contributed directly and closely to the resulting damage or injury. To illustrate proximate cause, let us look at the case of Abrogar versus Cosmos. Intergames Inc. organized an endurance running contest. Intergames plotted a 10-kilometer course starting from the Batasang Pambansa through public roads and streets to end at the Quezon Memorial Circle. Rommel, a young college student, applied with Intergames to be allowed to participate in the contest and after complying with Intergames requirements, his application was accepted and he was given an official number. At the designated time of the marathon, Rommel joined the other participants and ran the course plotted by Intergames. As it turned out, the Intergames failed to provide adequate safety and precautionary measures and exercise the diligence required of them by the nature of their undertaking. In that they failed to insulate and protect the participants of the marathon from vehicular and other dangers along the marathon route. Rommel was bumped by a jeepney that was then running along the route of the marathon and in spite of medical treatment given him at the hospital, he died later that same day due to severe head injuries. The issue in the case was whether or not the, the negligence of Intergames as the organizer was the proximate cause of the death of Rommel. The Supreme Court answered in the affirmative. Intergames staunchly insists that it was not liable, maintaining that even assuming that it was negligent, the negligence of the jeepney driver was the proximate cause of the death of Rommel, hence it should not be held liable. The Supreme Court, however, ruled that to be considered the proximate cause of the injury, the negligence need not be the event closest in time to the injury. A cause is still proximate, although farther in time in relation to the injury, if the happening of it set other foresee foreseeable events unto motion resulting ultimately in the damage. An examination of the records in accordance with the foregoing concept supports the conclusion that the negligence of intergames was the proximate cause of the death of Rommel and that the negligence of the jeepney driver was not an efficient intervening cause. First of all, the Supreme Court found that the negligence of intergames in not conducting the race in a road block off from vehicular traffic and in not properly coordinating the volunteer personnel manning the marathon route effectively set the stage of the injury complained of. Second, injury to the participants arising from an unfortunate vehicular accident on the route was an event known to and foreseeable by intergames which could then have been avoided if only intergames had acted due diligence by undertaking the race on a block off road and if only intergames had enforced and adapted more efficient supervision of the race through its volunteers. Thirdly, the negligence of the jeepney driver albeit an intervening cause, was not efficient enough to break the chain of connection between the negligence of intergames and the injurious consequence suffered by Rommel. An intervening cause to be considered efficient must be one not produced by wrongful act or omission but independent of it and adequate to bring the injurious results. Any cause intervening between the first wrongful cause and the final injury which might reasonably have been foreseen or anticipated by the original wrongdoing is not such an efficient intervening cause as will relieve the original wrong of its character as the proximate cause of the final injury. In fine, said the Supreme Court, 
it was the duty of Inter Games to guard Rommel against the foreseen risk, but failed to do so. This ends our lesson on the sources of obligations. See you next lesson.